Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about de novo submissions. What is a de novo? So a lot of people are not aware of what a de novo is. And the context here specifically is FDA medical device submissions. Only medical devices, only US FDA. It was a process that they created when something can't go down the 510K process. How are we going to create a brand new product classification because there isn't a good one for your product. You would only use a de novo if there is no existing product on the market that is used for the same intended use. And the other possibility is if, if there is something for the same intended use, but it uses different technology than your device, yours is newer novel technology, so it presents new risks. If there are new risks associated with your device that don't exist in the products that are on the market now, or you've got a completely different intended use, those are the two reasons why you might need a de novo. But what it is, is you're just asking the FDA, can you please create a brand new product classification for us? And they don't create the product classification until the first company has demonstrated that that intended use and that technology is safe and effective. So you have to actually provide clinical data showing that it's safe and effective. So a lot of people are like, well, um, what's the difference between what I have to do for a 510K versus a de novo? Well, they're essentially you're using the exact same form. The FDA ESTAR PDF template is what you use for either submission. But there are some different things that you have to attach in the de, de novo submission that you don't have to submit in a 510K and vice versa. So you don't have a substantial equivalence comparison in a de novo because you're not comparing it with another device that's already on the market. Um, not trying to show it's equivalent to. You're already saying we're doing a de novo because there's nothing out there like us. Number two, you're not actually providing a 510K summary saying how your device is um, similar or equivalent to another device on the market. So those two things you don't need. What you do need to add, here's the list. Number one, you have to identify whether you think your de novo device is going to be a class one device or a class two device. Class one means general controls. Class two means special controls, which you have to define for the brand new product. And that means you're also going to have to have um, design history file that you create. So you're going to have to implement design controls. I can't think of any reason why somebody would want to submit a de novo for a class one, you know, the, unless that's the only way they could get to market. But usually the, the way you would get to market is you would pick, a, um, you would develop a device for a class two product, and then you would go through the de novo process. If you had a very low risk device, maybe there's some other way that you would get to market. Um, but most of the time, these class one products the FDA is like, no, that, that, that's that's not equivalent. It exceeds the exemptions. Um, we're going to have to require that you submit a 510K for that. So that's that's usually the pathway that would go instead. So number one, the, the first thing you have to attach to your donovo that's totally different is classification rationale for why you think it's a one or a two, and it's almost always a two. Number two, a proposed regulation name and number. Um, they actually um, they don't ask you to provide the um, the number, but it's a good idea to know what that should be. Number one, you're going to know what review panel it's going to or medical device specialty. So that determines the first three numbers in the regulation. The last four numbers are dependent on where it falls within the subparts of that medical specialty. So they usually have like a subpart A, B, C, D. One of them will be general. That's usually A. B will usually be diagnostic. So that would so if your subpart B, it might be let's say eight 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 dot um, dot one. I think it would typically be the subpart B. Um, so whatever that first digit of the four digits is for the subpart, that's what your first digit is. And then the other three digits, the FDA will assign. So you, I, if I were going to guess what the number is going to be for your new classification, it might be 888.1XXX. And I don't know what the Xs will be. The FDA defines those. The second part is the name of it. What name 
should this classification be? In, because you're the one submitting the request to create a new classification, you also have the opportunity here to name what this is going to be, and you want to follow the format the FDA already has for classification names. They may um, not use your name. They may come up with their own, but it, it is an opportunity for you to suggest this is what I think we ought to name this. And because you're the developer, you probably know the technology as well or better um, in what terms would typically be used. Number three thing that you need to include, proposed special controls. So special controls are beyond labeling. So labeling is a general control. Um, special controls would be things like sterilization validation, software validation, um, shelf life, biocompatibility, electrical safety. All those would be special controls. Human factors would be a special control. Animal or clinical studies would be uh, special controls. So you are able to determine what things are going to need to be done by anybody else that makes a product like yours. Now, you want to be careful. Um, if you, in the past, they used to have special controls guidance documents. Those haven't gone away, but the FDA has stopped writing new special controls guidance documents, and now they actually put the special controls right in the regulation. So what you'll see is here's the regulation name, here's the number of it, there's the intended use for that type of product, and then there are the special controls right below that. So it would define what kind of special controls would be appropriate for that type of device based on the technology and the intended use. The next thing that you have to include is a draft benefit risk analysis. Unlike 510Ks that usually don't require risk management documents, some do, but most don't. And if you read 14971-2019, it says that if the benefits, uh, I'm sorry, if a risk is unacceptable, then you have to do a benefit risk analysis, but you're not required to do one if the risks are acceptable. The FDA says, no, if you are developing a brand new product classification, a de novo, or you're doing a new humanitarian device exemption, or your company is doing a PMA, those are cases where you would be required to do a benefit risk analysis. And they actually have guidance documents telling you how to do that that align pretty closely with what's in 24971 in the guidance telling you how to do a benefit risk analysis. So if you go to clause 7.4 and 24971, it gives you a pretty good uh, explanation of how to do it step by step, but it starts with the benefits. And they want to be quantitative. They're like, um, how will it benefit? When will it benefit? What are the duration of the benefits? What is the magnitude of benefits? What are the what is the likelihood that the user or patient is going to actually benefit from the device? And then they want you to do the same thing for the risk, and then a conclusion as to whether the benefits outweigh the risk. And if you don't have benefits for your device that are adequate, they're not going to give you de novo. So that's one of the number one reasons why de novos don't get a, approved by the FDA or granted. The reason why is because they don't demonstrate the benefit relative to risks. Next item is a risk mitigation table. I don't like the word mitigation because they eliminated that in 2007 from the 14971 guidance, but I'm not going to be able to change the FDA anytime soon. Um, the comparable um, phrase that they use in the 14971 is a risk control. So mitigation, risk control, they're using them the same. The difference is Risk control suggests that you can't eliminate it completely, whereas mitigation suggests you've eliminated it completely. What we're really doing is reducing the risk, hopefully to zero, but almost never do, do we actually get there unless we eliminate the potential for it by eliminating the feature. Uh, so if you make a non-power device, no longer does it have the risk of electrocution. Um, but you have to have a table, and there are lots of examples in all the de novos that give a table and that's one of the things you have to submit is your own table, and you want to go systematically through the different types of risks. And when we say risk, we don't mean each individual line item. We're talking about the categories of risk. So biological risk would be an example, chemical risk, risk of radiation, risk of software, that level, not the individual line items of every single thing in your risk analysis. Uh, so it's a very high-level table. And for example, you have electrical power, you're going to do electrical safety and EMC testing. You have software, you're going to do software validation. You have use to error potential, you're going to have human factors validation. So that's the level they're looking for. And then they also want in your table that you're submitting, you attach a document um, or reference a, make a cross-reference to the document in your submission that shows how you've mitigated that risk or reduced that risk. 
The next thing that you have to attach alternative, alternative procedures and techniques to the subject's device's technology. So whatever device you're submitting, what are the alternatives? And the number one thing I see companies um, forget to do is including the possibility of drug treatments. So some things that you can treat with devices, you can also treat with a drug. And there's a debate whether it's better or worse than the drug. Drugs have systemic effects. So and they're usually long term and could be chronically um, impacting the patient. Whereas if you had to do surgery for a patient like open heart surgery, that's going to have a very acute risk. But once the person recovers, um, they presumably won't continue to have any exposure to those risks. So very high short-term risk, long-term short, uh, long-term low risk for surgery, but a lower risk short-term for drugs, but a higher risk long-term because you have to chronically take this drug that may have systemic effects. So you have to compare, and they want each one, and they want you also to address that in your benefit risk analysis because you, you have different risk benefit profiles based on what your alternatives would be. And then last but not least, you have to explain what efforts you went through to try to identify a predicate device. And if you have actually submitted a 513G submission, then you had the conclusion in that 513G from the FDA that this would be a de novo and they provide their justification. So you could include that. You also still want to explain what things you went through to try to find one. But if you already have a 513G that says this is what we think it is, you're really looking at has anything new happened since then? So those are the documents that you have to submit that are different for a de novo submission. What also is usually different, I think I already mentioned this, is the clinical study requirements. Almost always you have a uh, clinical trial or clinical study requirement for a de novo, and only about 10, maybe 12% of the time do we have that for 510Ks. Um, you might provide some clinical data uh, for certain devices because it's easier than the alternative methods or cheaper, but most of the time we're providing clinical data. And in the world of IVDs, you're always providing clinical data, which makes the, the line between a new IVD that's a de novo versus an IVD that's a 510K, there's very little difference between the process for those two because um, you're still going to be providing that clinical performance data for both types. Um, Another difference is going to be your timeline. For the FDA, they have their FDA days, 90 days for the 510K and 150 for a de novo, but the reality is they're much slower than that in both cases. There are a few products that are 510Ks that will be reviewed in that 90-day timeline, but most are more like 120 or longer, whereas um, IVDs, more like 180 days. In the de novos, they're actually averaging 390 calendar days. So a lot of delays in there where people are having to submit their uh, clinical data and then maybe have to do additional testing or maybe even do a bridge study or another clinical study to address the FDA's concerns. So a lot of time required for a de novo relative to a 510K, more than twice as long typically. Um, and the last thing that's different is the cost. For a 510K, we have standard fees around 21,000 and small business fees at $54.40, so $5,440. It's 6.66 times as much for the de novo. So you're looking at $36,000 for the small business and $145,000 for a de novo standard fee. So more money, clinical study, longer review, and all those documents that I said you have to attach. You get out of a 510K summer, you get out of a substantial equivalence comparison you use the same form, but that's what's different between a 510K and a de novo. And the de novo, the big thing here is it gives you a brand new product classification. You're the first product in, and it'll probably be at least a year before another person, another company comes in and submits a 510K using your device, but you've just blazed a brand new pathway and everybody else is gonna benchmark their product in a 510K against your de novo including yourself for any product changes you make. If this was helpful to you, uh, if you had questions, um, if it was helpful to you, please click on the like and share it with others. 
if you want to know more about the review timeline, I put a hyperlink down below for the review timeline on a de novo. And if you want to discuss your de novo project with us, there's a link down below for our contact us page. So you can contact me or Lindsay Walker, and we can tell you about the de novo process a little bit more, how we handle it, and we can answer some of your questions. I hope that was helpful. If you have any suggestions for future webinars or live streaming videos, please put them down below. I love your suggestions, and I try to answer your questions every week. And that's what I'm going to do next. See you next week. Bye-bye.